Hello everyone and welcome to our new series of chess tactics and mainly I would say chess tactics for beginners and intermediate players. As we know, well we read, we hear that tactics are the most important part of chess and the lower the level is, they are much more important because we see blunders and opportunities to use tactics, we will discuss in a second what are tactics, much more than uh, uh, at grandmaster levels. Um, we don't see, let's say, uh, as a grandmaster blunder pieces very often. I mean, everyone blunders, right? Carlsen and every grandmaster, but much less often than the beginner or average club player that many times, well, a lot of blunders and tactical possibilities are available. So what are tactics? You know, I, I went and uh, read in Wikipedia. In chess, a tactics refer to a sequence of moves that limits the opponent's option and may result in tangible gain. Well, basically, what does it mean, sequence of moves that limits the opponent's options? Those are forcing moves. Forcing moves. That is the heart of our tactics. In chess, we call them forcing moves. There are books that were written uh, on forcing moves. Well, what are they? Well, if we, first of all, start to think, well, the most forcing move is a check. Because by the rules of the game, when you check your opponent, well, he has three possibilities. Well, to block it, to capture it, or to move his king. Anything else is... Well, if he cannot do any of those, it's checkmate. So it doesn't matter. He has to do those. Captures. Captures are considered very forcing. Not like a check, but 99% of the time when you capture something, well, the opponent's going to capture back because, hey, the base of the game is material. Well, you play the game, whether your opponent plundered the queen on move 5 in an absolute kid's beginner or whether you are Magnus Carlsen playing against Anand and after 5 hours managing to win a pawn and translate that into winning endgame and, well, win the world championships because of that. Still, most of those, the final outcome is some material gain. And after you have some material gain, well you can, well, translate it in different ways. But to get to that material gain, well, we need to win material, right? And the best way to do it is, well, direct captures or tactics. Forcing moves are leading us there. So we discussed a check, we discussed a capture, and creating big threats. Well, the biggest threat that we can create is checkmate. If you are playing a move that is threatening to checkmate your opponent in one move, most likely he has to prevent it, well, unless he will get checkmated, or he has a sequence, a full sequence by himself, faster than yours. And the same if you are attacking material. Let's say you are attacking your opponent rook, well, he can either attack your queen, and then maybe you are the one that needs to move, but if he cannot, most likely he's going to move his rook, so those are our forcing moves, or as uh, Wikipedia described it, series of moves that limits the opponent option. Limits the opponent option, forcing him to do something. That is what we use by forcing moves. And there are so many uh, types of them which we are going to cover. Uh, either it is forks or skews, batteries, discover attacking, uh, uh, removal of the guard, overloading, pins, many, many, intermediate move, many, many ideas like that. The importance of them is one, have you win material? We will start with one topic that I find maybe the broader one, and that is double attack. How do we get to double attack and what does it give us? Well, we know that our goal in tactics is to win material. So pretty much to everything that we are going to touch, the goal is to be winning material, period. Now, what does double attack all mean? As it sounds, it's basically the same thing as a fork, pretty much, although fork refers more to a knight. We identify two pieces that are not defended 
or they can be defended, but we are attacking them with a piece of lower value. So anyway, we are going to win material. Let's say the two rooks are defended, but we are attacking them with a knight. Let's say forking them. Well, they are defended, but still, the knight is three points. The rook five, we're going to win material. And after we identify those pieces, let's for now focus on the ones that are undefended. Well, we need to think about how we can target them. Now, it can be two pieces that are undefended, or it can be a check and a piece. It was John Nunn, that, well, a great chess player in the 80s, 90s, and wrote some of the best books out there that coined this phrase, LPDO, loose pieces drop off. That is really our entire topic for today, for next video, maybe we'll give it one more, because it's such an important topic. If you have loose pieces for too many moves, too many moves, you have loose pieces. At some point, there might be some tactical possibility. A double check, a double attack, something that can connect two of them and have one player win material. For example, this basic position, white is to play. It's easy to see that the knight is undefended. And we can also check the king at the same time. So, queen c6 is the move that simply winning the knight by force. Now, someone can say, hey, I can play queen a4, pin the knight and win it. It is not as forcing as a check. It is not as forcing as a check. Black can defend the knight here, rook b8. And white actually won nothing. There's a huge difference between attacking something and forcing something. Many times you attack and actually the opponent cannot defend or you attack several things and it's working. But forcing things are the base of everything. So I would like us to go over quite many examples pretty much in every video we will do so. And what I would suggest is I will put the position on the board and for you to pause maybe, think for yourself what is the move that you would play and then, well, click play and see what we are thinking about this puzzle. I will say that I'm starting at a very lower level. This is our first video. I just want to say one more general thing about puzzles versus chess games. In a puzzle that says Double attack. Well, you know that you need to find two pieces that you can attack, or a king and a piece somehow with a check and win material. It is very similar to someone is telling you, hey, there is a treasure in this field, but you need to start digging on the right corner. It's the easiest part. You know there is something, and also you know what to look, right? I'm telling you the topic. Then there are puzzles that some, someone is saying nothing. You just get a puzzle, Play your best move. That's basically, there is a treasure here, but start digging. You don't know where it is. And then there is a chess game. That's the most difficult one. Here is a field. Start digging. I don't know if you have something or not. So that's why a player needs to do so many puzzles in order to get the habit of identifying, finding, getting used to where tactical ideas would exist, where there will be those things. The same way that a basketball player is shooting hundreds of thousands of free throws in his life to improve. Well, a chess player the same. And, you know, to do thousands of puzzles is not much. If you get decent books, and we will recommend decent books and decent websites that are specifically for those, and you say, I want to do 20, 30 puzzles a week, a week, every week 30 puzzles, that's 1,500 puzzles a year. That's 3,000 puzzles in two years. Well, it will be very difficult not to improve the chess by doing so. Okay, now we will see our positions. White is to play here. Once again, if you figure out that the rook is undefended and also the knight, but there is no way to attack the knight, queen b7 will be captured. But the rook is undefended. Okay, queen d5. And 
winning the rook. Now, let's say that the rook was somewhere else. Okay, let's just put the rook over here. Okay, now, queen b7, same idea, same principle, just different, different piece. Now, if the rook is, for example, on e6, well, there is no way to win because one hugely important thing when looking and discussing tactics, thinking about your opponent reply. An absolute beginner would say, hey, check, if he would see the idea at all, I'm winning a piece. You have to think about the next step. Okay, rook e7. White won a pawn, it is still his best move, but not the piece. And the same here, right? Let's see. I gave this position to some players. They suggested queen c1 check. Okay, but what white gains after rook c7? Well, nothing. This is a piece that is undefended. The knight on h4, if we can connect it to the king on c8, white is indeed winning in this continuation. No check in this position. But, are there two pieces that are undefended? Yes, they are. The bishop on b7 and the knight on e7. Well, how can we attack both of them? Queen to c7. Queen to c7 is attacking the bishop on b7 and the knight on e7, winning one of them. What about this one? Some of the geometry is a bit more complicated, right? The pieces are next to one another, it's easy. And actually we will see that retreating moves are the most difficult ones. So let's look at this position. Which pieces are not defended? The rook and the knight. How can we attack both of them? Well, we just need to look at a little bit the board and figure out that the f2 square is attacking the rook and the knight. Winning. Winning most likely the knight. Now, what would happen if queen d8 is played? It also looks like, hey, it's a great check and attacking the knight. But here we have to think about the opponent next move. King g7 and defending the knight. But if I take the king from g8 and put it on b8, now the rook actually is defended. So queen f2 is meaningless. But queen d8 is winning. So identifying what to do is the most important thing. Well, identifying the idea. Okay, those pieces are undefended. I cannot do that. But then we have to see what is the opponent best reply. And only then, once we have the idea and the right continuation, well, then we can play it. No, idea in, is not enough. Black to play. Which pieces are undefended? The bishops. It is black to play. Black to play. How can we attack both bishops? One move. Queen h5. By the way, I am going to throw here some other ideas that we will discuss in our long tactical series. What if black plays an intermediate move? Something basically saying, well, attacking another piece here. Bishop e7. White has nothing better to play here other than to move a piece and attack the rook. It's not a proper intermediate move, but let's say in some sequences we will see a lot of those ideas. Black can take, but then, okay, he's only a pawn up. Okay, black is winning here, he's a pawn up, white has bad pawns, but just a pawn up. On the other hand, instead of capturing, black has a better move. That's why I said, and I will say it for the entire series and every video, we always have to see what the opponent can play. Queen takes b b5, bishop on b5. Yeah, black would be winning, but after queen e5, check. And a double attack, well, it's finished. 
immediately. Next one. Okay, so far we were looking at ideas of double attack that involve a check and attacking an undefended piece, a check and attacking an undefended piece, or, or attacking two undefended pieces. Well, there are no two undefended pieces here, and there is not even a check possible, but there is an, uh, one undefended pieces, or piece, sorry, and a threat. If you suggested queen c4, you're right on. The rook is undefended and under attack, and queen c8, checkmate. White is going to win material here. By the way, putting black spawn on a6, okay, I don't think black is... Black is in trouble in this position. He has a rook, knight, two pawns. I mean, black is looks quite okay here. There is no checkmate threat, nothing. So, it was a big threat of a checkmate. Remember, one of our most forcing moves. And combine it with attacking an undefended rook. Gets you the game. Now, this is a very tricky one. We see the rook is undefended. We also see that there are possibilities for checkmate on the back rank. But what, what to do here? Well, there are two ways to get it done, but only one of them is correct. Queen e1 looks like a very logical move. But can you find a defense for black? Once again, every time that I'm kind of pausing, I would suggest you to Pause, really, the video and think for yourself if you like. Well, attacking the rook and checkmate on e8, but g5 is possible. Ha! Huh. Giving the king escape square and protecting the rook. That's serious. White might still be better, but okay, that's not our point. Queen g5, attacking the rook, threatening checkmate, 1-0, game over. You see identifying the idea, okay, I want to attack the rook and checkmate the king. Perfect. But now how to do that? Well, black is to play here. We see the rook is undefended. We also spot checkmate on g2. Well, we understand that queen b7 is going to be our move. It's those basic tactics that are going to make the difference for many, many of the games. Now, as we have seen before, recognizing patterns, whether it is back rank pattern, a very basic one, or checkmate patterns, is crucial. It just makes the entire process easy, fast, and efficient. The bishop on c4, undefended. Checkmate on h2. Now, there are some people that might suggest bishop take and check and take. Is this bad? Okay, it's not horrible. Nothing really wrong. Black won the pawn. Okay, white, white will have, of course, uh, enough compensation here, I think, with b3, c4, but that's another story. But why not to get it in a much, much more efficient way? Queen h4, and the game is just finished. Queen h4, and the game is just finished. Bishop and checkmate, the game is finished. Well, how about this one? Black is up a pawn and white rooks under attack and pretty much most players would immediately move the rook. Oh, the rook's under attack, but... If before the h2 square was a crucial one, f7 square. So we know those are key squares, key squares in all positions. Checkmates on f7, a7, well, g7 and g2 are also, but I think f7, h7, those squares are more common. So, attacking the knight, threatening checkmate, winning a piece, 
and winning the game just like that okay why to play I see the long diagonal the same as you do and if you put this position to beginners well immediately they will think and say oh well, look at that long diagonal queen d4 okay that's not bad I also want to check my opponent but what after f6 hmm not so clear suddenly queen c3 what after f6 on the other hand what after queen h6? I still have the same idea as checkmate, only that if I create a simple threat and the opponent has 10 ways to defend, okay, what's, what's really are we doing? Nothing. The idea is to create threats to make it as difficult for the opponent to react to them. Okay, that's checkmate. That's a piece, a bishop. That is 1-0. Back to undefended pieces. Where are the undefended pieces for black? The rook and the bishop. And it's not important whether it is checkmate or not. It is not important if it's the pawn could have been on h6. The same move would have won the game. White to play. I mentioned before, moving backward is one of the most difficult things to play. Many times people do not see it. It's not easy. Even some really strong players, grandmasters, do not see threats that are because of a piece moving or defending something backward. Kramnik lost a game against Deep Fritz where the computer had a knight on f8 and Kramnik unbelievably missed a checkmate on h7, his king was on h8 and the knight was from f8 defending that square I said and I remember that there is absolutely no way in the world that Kramnik would have missed such a check if the defender of h7 wouldn't be, or the attacker more accurate to say, wouldn't be a knight on f8, white knight, but a knight on g5, because our vision goes forward, so, oh, knight on g5, queen on c2, oh, queen h7 is being threatened. When the knight was on f8, it was a bit trickier. Well, why I say it here? Because the rook's under attack, or not yet, but undefended. The king is here. It's moving backward that is winning the game. Check. And our last one for today. Big board, 64 squares, it's a big board, but if we can connect all the dots, well, we will not miss tactics. I like this puzzle a lot, I think it shows many things. We discussed checkmate patterns, right? We discussed undefended pieces. Well, then you should all suggest rook queen h1. Look at this move. Moving to the edge of the board, to threaten checkmate on one corner or pretty much corner of the board and attack a rook completely on the other side. This is all over the board. Game over. Some great books. I am just saying here, I will also write it on the next to the PGN and description of uh, every uh, show. Some great books that I can recommend are Susan Polger. She has two levels of books. A World Champion Guide to Chess, that's for beginners, and for let's say players above a thousand rating, I would suggest A World Champion Guide to Chess. Chess Steps is a great series by Cole Van Wigerden. Uh, a great series of books for players from pretty much beginners and up until, well, 2000, actually, in the last step, the 
positions are really are really difficult. I mean, some players, masters even have some difficulty in some positions. But it's called chess steps, learning chess chess steps. So for I would say fifteen hundred players or re- or under and real beginners, steps one, two, and three are absolutely uh, uh, great books. Uh, there are many others. I can mention Yasser Seravan's Winning Chess Tactics, and his entire series is great. And I'm certain there are many other great books. I'm not here to, you know, not advertising any of them, not getting any commissions or, or part. It's just that for my experience, those are some of the best books that I've seen out there for beginners. For uh, After than that, there are some amazing tactical uh, tactical books, but they are for much higher levels. Well, that was our introduction. Hanging pieces, checkmate threats, and get used to it because that's what you're going to hear and see this entire series. Bye-bye.